Hello, everyone, and welcome to the GLG webcast, Enabling an Insight-Driven Organization, presented by GLG's events team. My name is Veronica Mabry, and I will be your host today. We are pleased to have Andrew uh, Alessandro De Fiore joining us today. By way of introduction, Alessandro is a consultant, author, and media commentator on strategy and innovation. He founded ESCI Consulting with the aim of creating a truly unique global consulting firm. Alessandro started his career as a product manager at Colgate Palmolive, and he went on to work at Gemini Consulting. In 2000, Alessandro founded his first management consulting firm, Venture Consulting, which was sold in 2008 to Teffen. Alessandro is one of the most influential global voices in shaping how we think about and practice strategy. He is the originator of the concept of the insight-driven organization and was included in Thinkers 50 Radar as one of the 30 global thinkers most likely to influence the future of management and organizations. Alessandro is also a frequent author and contributor to global management magazines like HBR, London Business School Review, Rotmint Management, and others. As a reminder, the presentation should last approximately 45 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answer answers. You may ask a question at any time via the text box within your window. All questions will be addressed at the end of the call. They will also remain anonymous and confidential. Lastly, I would like to remind all participants that Alessandro may have limitations on ESCI consulting, and he will decline to answer any questions which are related to confidential matters. So with that, I'll hand this over to Alessandro. Thank you, Veronica, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So for uh, uh, today, for the next uh, 45 minutes, um, we will uh, cover the following topic. First, uh, a background on the framework. So this is based on a research we have been uh, doing uh, five years ago, and the research was uh, supported by a number of uh, cases. So we will present only three of those cases. And, uh, and then we go on the last section, which is on how to apply. So if uh, I want to execute in a company, uh, what is uh, the step, uh, the initial step, and then w which are the following steps to execute. So let's start with the theory and also the research insights. I'm starting with a quote from Peter Drucker. And as you can see, this quote is about uh, no, uh, the ultimate competitive advantage. I think the exact quote was uh, the ultimate company's competitive advantage will derive from the systematic capability to generate a customer insight. And this was Peter about 20 years ago. And the key words here are a systematic capability. And uh, as you can see in the last uh, 20 years, uh, no, a lot of um, discussion and research and uh, also practitioners in companies have been continuing to talk about customer centricity. Now there is a new wave of a customer centricity. But no, the true reality is that still, no, many companies, they speak about customer centricity, but no, the, the how, how do you execute, how do you actually create a company which is uh, fully oriented on customers, and particularly on customers' insights, is uh, still something that no, many companies uh, are struggling with. So we did a research to try to understand uh, best practices. And uh, best practices, obviously, in customer centricity and in the generation of uh, customers' insights. And uh, we found a very interesting analogy with uh, Toyota and uh, with the manufacturing system, the production system of Toyota. And uh, everybody will say why, why there is a fit. Where is the fit between a manufacturing system and something which is related to marketing and innovation, so which is starting with the customer insights. And, and the fit is in the principles. So if you look at the Toyota production system, there are fundamentally two beliefs or two, uh, two principles behind the system. Uh, the first one is uh, everything is pushed down. So the responsibility for problem solving on the shop floor if you have an issue on the shop floor in production, the responsibility for addressing that issue is uh, up to the blue collar. So it goes down, down in the organization, and there is a, a democratization of the responsibility and the accountability. The second principle is uh, a kind of obsession with uh, standardizing uh, the skills, the methods, and the practices. So if you think about uh, uh, lean and Six Sigma in the shop floor, 
there are hours and hours of training and uh, coaching on the job on the same tools, on the same ways of working, on the same methods. And, uh, and, uh, and this is it. This is the way of uh, doing a brainstorming. This is a way to do a statistical analysis. And, and all the company, all the people, including the blue collars, are trained in an obsessive way on, on those tools. And the tools don't change. They are always standard. They are always the, the same. So if we take those two principles and we apply to the world of a customer insights, um, and we can we can actually build a matrix like this. So on uh, one horizontal axis, on the horizontal axis, you have a responsibility for customer insights, while on the vertical axis, you have the standardization of uh, learning and practices. And we see a lot of companies to be on the bottom left. So Schumpeter's bias, even companies, the uh, large companies who are no uh, professing and declaring that they want to be customer centric they still no there is a very limited effort in uh, cascading the responsibility for the generation of a customer insights into uh, the mass of an employee and there is a limited or uh, zero uh, effort and investment in standardizing the processes the procedures the tools the methods and the skills for generating those customer insights in the company on on the right on the bottom right there is another uh, uh, cluster of companies. We call those the creative chaos. Uh, mostly are startups or early stage. So the culture is a culture where everybody is incentivized to take the initiative and understand what, which are the customer needs and the insights. But no, there is a very little focus, energy, and investment in standardizing the way of doing it. And the, and the reason why you standardize is obviously to increase the return on investment and to be more effective. Most of the consumer goods companies are on the upper quadrant on the left. We call these only for professionals. So those uh, companies, they do standardize the methods to do um, market research or to generate the customer insights. But no, this is uh, confined only to a small group of people. We call these uh, uh, professionals. No, it's a profession. So it's usually the market research uh, department in consumer goods. But no, in other companies, you have a, a small number of people, for example, in business intelligence, in uh, other industries, in other companies, who are responsible to generate the strategic and marketing insights. So, so this is not a responsibility for anybody else in the company. Uh, the best practice we found are, on the contrary, on the upper quadrant on, on the right. We call this community of explorers. And they follow the same principles of a Toyota production system. So the responsibility is, uh, uh, is democratic. So it's not only a small group of people who are responsible for it, but now it's uh, a large group of people in the company. And the second, you know, this large group of people is uh, trained on a standard uh, number of tools and, and practices. Uh, and we, uh, if we look at the uh, upper quadrant, so we have uh, three cases we want to show you here uh, on three companies that have been doing uh, exactly what I mentioned, so pushing down the responsibility and standardizing the practices on how to do it. So if we go to the next page, uh, you can see the characteristics of those companies. So those companies, they, uh, first of all, they identify the sensors. Uh, the sensors means uh, who is going to be uh, engaged into developing customer insights. Usually those are the frontline people. So uh, the, the simplest example is uh, the sales reps, uh, but it can be the technical engineers on the field. It can be the contact center people. It can be the marketing people. But no, we need to identify who are the employees who are going to be engaged into the generation of customer insights. The second characteristic is uh, standardize, identify which are the most relevant methods and tools, and then uh, standardize them, and then train the people. So you're not training all the company, but you're training the sensors, obviously. The sensors are going to use those methods uh, to generate customer insights. The third step is uh, the, the process. No, and actually, even companies who are uh, uh, talking about customer centricity, you know, in, in my experience as a consultant, that they don't have a 
process to generate the calcium ion sites. Uh, and the reason why they don't have a process to generate the calcium ion sites is because they go outside. They fundamentally outsource to agencies, market research companies, and uh, so you don't need a process because you, know, you do a briefing. Based on the briefing, maybe there is a competitive uh, beauty contest, uh, then it's assigned, then there is a field of market research, usually three months, then it's coming back, a report, so everything is outsourced, so there is no real inside generation process in a, in a company. So in a, in a, in a system like uh, we, we see at uh, Intuit or Unilever, you need to have a, a process. And then fourth is routinize uh, the, into the jobs. So if you want a sales rep uh, spending even uh, one hour, two hours per month uh, doing a customer insights uh, generation and uh, doing a, a customer's explorations, obviously you need to have in the job description, job description, otherwise it's not going to happen. And the last one is uh, the assigned home. Uh, so unless there is a, someone who is the architect of such a system, this is not going to happen because there is no clear responsibility. So let's look at a few cases on how uh, those three companies have, uh, have done it. So the first one is Arena. We are here in the swimwear business. It's a company uh, back in the 70s has been founded. And uh, the challenge of this company was for, that for the last five years, uh, it was fundamentally flat in terms of, uh, in terms of growth. Uh, so the uh, strategic ambition was to look beyond the existing core market of uh, swimmers. So the core swimmers are the ones who are very good or professional in the swimming, and they go uh, to the swimming pool uh, every week at least a couple of times. And uh, so this is the core market of a swimwear company. And uh, to enlarge the revenues and to generate new revenues, obviously they need to look outside the core swimmers. So this is what they did. First of all, uh, they identify the sensors. And the sensors is uh, the simplest case. So the sensors uh, for Arena were the sales people. So all the sales rep of the company globally, they were identified as a sensors. But also they did something very creative. In addition to the um, sales reps, they also identified the distributors and the sales reps over the distributors. So they identify internally and externally sensors, and then they train them. So they trained on how to probe a customer insight, how to do exploratory interviews. So the, the training was on very, very simple, how to do observation, very, very simple techniques. And they standardized, they trained the distributors, they trained also the salespeople. And the number of innovation, they started to pop up from those customers' insights in the pipeline. Uh, one which is very famous is the Burkini. So the Burkini was invented by Arena, then it was copied by everybody after six months because this is what happened in the swimwear. Uh, but no, the original insight came from a distributor in the Middle East, and he was doing observations using the techniques uh, learned from Arena. And uh, they were observing that uh, due to uh, religious uh, constraints and requests, obviously they had to be uh, swimming with a full body, uh, full body coverage, and they were using these uh, white cotton suits. And obviously when you go in the water, you are not free. I, you, know, you, you, feel, uh, you feel constrained, and then you get out of the water, and those are drying up after hours and hours. So this is very unpleasant experience. So they were observing this experience. They were obviously checking this insight in a number of different countries in the Middle East, and they were passing the insight to the marketing department, the central corporate marketing department of Arena, and they were very quick, like in three months, to develop a product using a high-tech, dry-fast type of fabric. So this is one. The second one is exactly with the same customer inside generation process uh, from a sales rep. Uh, a sales rep observed that in the swimming pool in uh, Germany and in France and in Italy, so in uh, two or three countries, this was confirmed by sales reps in multiple countries, that the beginners in the swimming pool, they were struggling to develop a good stroke uh, due to breathe issues. And the, 
the, the situation is that when you are a beginner or not a good swimmer and uh, you create anxiety, you have anxiety while you are swimming and this is not a good experience, you drop it. You drop it, uh, you become a non-customer because you become a non-swimmer. So uh, this is a big issue for a company with flat growth, which is a co-leader together with Speedo. How do you grow the market? And they identify this insight, and based on this insight, they develop it, a new product which is uh, patented, so they can protect, uh, contrary to the burkini, and it's called the freestyle breather. The freestyle breather is a very simple pair of plastic foils that every, anybody can attach to the goggles and make the experience easier. And I think we can see, we can watch the video, and you will understand how this product innovation works. If we can launch the video now. Thank you. There's no training aid currently on the market to solve the problem of breathing during freestyle. Arena tackled the problem of launching the Crystal Breather, a new tool dedicated to beginners and non-swimmers to improve the breathing technique. The Freestyle Breather prevents water inhalation by protecting mouth and nose. Creates a larger air pocket by announcing the ball wave. And guides to a better head alignment preventing excessive head rotation. The Freestyle Breather is a very simple product to solve a big problem. It's quick and easy to assemble. Breather, you swim easier for longer distance and you enjoy swimming. Can I get started, Veronica? Yes, the video is done playing. Thanks, Alessandro. Okay, thank you. So you uh, you have seen some of the product innovation. They both came from uh, two customers insights, one generated by distributor sales rep, the other one generated by companies sales rep. So the beauty is that those customer insights were identified through very simple observation or customer exploration techniques. Uh, where the sensors uh, uh, were trained, they were then shared instantly through videos and, uh, and posting and text on a simple app that was made available on uh, the smartphones of the sales reps and the distributors. So this, uh, this app is uh, something they bought in the market. Uh, it's actually is a very good uh, uh, and simple app uh, with also a very lower level of uh, fees and investment. It's called iTrack in the case, and there are a number of them in the marketplace. So fundamentally, they created a system with a, a zero level of investment because of the smartphones were available already, uh, handy uh, to all the sales reps and the distributors. And this app uh, 
actually you can uh, rent for a few hundred dollars per, uh, per month on a small number of uh, people. And uh, they were up and running uh, with the system. Uh, they could actually identify the insights, uh, share with the central marketing. Central marketing uh, could say, okay, this insight is uh, very interesting, and then uh, create uh, two additional questions, send those two questions uh, to the sales reps, uh, all of them globally, just to check on those two questions or two assumptions, then coming back, confirming, eventually developing an MVP. The MVP was uh, like a storyboard that was sent back to the sales reps. The sales reps, they were showing the storyboard, the video uh, with the MVP, confirming, getting the feedback, pivot, uh, doing a pivot and, and checking. All this was done in a number of weeks. Uh, and if you think about the market research cycle, uh, when you outsource only for doing the beauty contest, uh, creating uh, the contract, uh, signing the contract, doing the field, and coming back based on uh, and the results coming back based on our experience. This is a process that is going to take two months, three months, four months, and and then is 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 only one time. While with a system like this, Arena was actually capturing insight confirming, developing hypothesis, confirming, developing MVP, uh, changing the product, developing MVP, changing the product, and they did this in less than a month, all the cycle up to the design of the product. So if we go, uh, so this is the process that I just explained. This is a high level process, but now any company who wants to go on an insight driven uh, organization model, they need to have a customer insight generation process. So this is a, the simple version, but no, the key of any of those processes is how do you link the inside generation to the innovation uh, process and to the marketing processes. So those processes, they need to be seamless integrated. And this is exactly what they did at the uh, arena where the central marketing was uh, fundamentally acting as a facilitator, coordinator, and was receiving all the insights and feedbacks from the people in the field globally. So if we go to the second case, this is Intuit. So we are in the uh, United States here, and uh, the company is uh, a company which is um, uh, known for being a software and uh, tax preparation company. Uh, this company it was born like a very customer-centric uh, Company. So the issue there was when I scaled from a nearly stage company to a multi-billion company, now it's about seven billion in terms of sales turnover, uh, scaling the company from a small one to a multi-billion, how can I continue to be customer centric? And one of the, uh, because Scott Cook, the founder, has been uh, uh, always obsessed with the customer centricity. So one of the uh, actions they took at, uh, into it was uh, to codify into everybody. So in this case, if you think about the sensors of Arena, they were fundamentally the sales reps. In this case, the sensors is everybody in the company. So this is a stream in the case of um, uh, Intuit. Everybody, the executives, the senior manager, the people who are developing the software, the sales rep, the marketing people, even uh, uh, even the finance people, everybody has in the job description that they need to develop, they need to do a number of hours per year in interviewing or in observing or in spending time at the contact center, so interacting with the customers. And the way they do it, they do mostly through tools that are uh, uh, based on design thinking, so explorations and uh, experience cycle. Uh, so, but those tools again are standardized and they are trained. There is a center of excellence around design thinking in uh, in Intuit, and uh, and you can see the beauty of the result. No, they end up with uh, every year with about 10,000 hours of uh, in-context observations run by the employee. This is a massive number of hours. Uh, of uh, potential insights uh, generated by the employee. Most important, uh, no, the reason, one of the key reasons uh, Scott Cook uh, pushed for this is about the culture. So if uh, everybody is uh, in front of the customer at least a few hours every quarter 
or every six months, this is, this is fantastic to continue to develop and nourish in their case or to build in other cases a culture of a customer centricity. So, but the message here is important that if you want someone to spend time with your customers, he must be in the job description. And this is exactly what Intuit did uh, for fundamentally all the employees. The third case is Unilever. I know you know the company is a consumer goods, one of the three or four consumer goods uh, giant in, uh, around the world, about uh, 60 billion. The issue of uh, consumer good, multinational consumer goods is that you no know, local companies, a country based uh, with the local brands, are uh, gain momentum and uh, gain, gaining market share. So again, it's going, and why they are gaining market share? Because they are more aligned to the taste of uh, the local customers, the local consumers. So how do you how do you respond? Again, it's about customer centricity. The Unilever case is extremely interesting for number one you see here which is assign a home. So what they did is uh, something very few companies they do. So they uh, fundamentally zero based the market research group. The market research group was uh, as in all the consumer goods company reporting to marketing. And uh, so low in the hierarchy, but also low in the ability to influence key decisions at the executive level. So the zero based the market research, they created something which is called consumer market insight unit with a, a direct reporting line to the CEO. Uh, so this is a, the fundamentally the architect at the Unilever of an insight driven organization. What the CMI does is uh, they identify the tools, they develop the tools, and they provide also through training to all the organization. Also, they do uh, not only the qualitative part, in this case, also they do the quantitative part, so also the insights uh, coming from uh, big data and from analyzing the data. So they fundamentally integrated in one unit uh, the qualitative uh, insight uh, using uh, the system I just explained at ARENA and, uh, and at Intuit uh, together with uh, the quantitative part of uh, big data all in one unit, and this unit is reporting directly to the CEO. So you can understand that the ability to influence key decisions at business unit level, strategy level, and marketing level on a global basis. So some of the tools they are using, or they develop it. Uh, one very simple, so in the case of Arena, they used an app, which is available in the market, it's called iTrack. In the case of Unilever, they developed their own internal app to make sure that sales reps, marketing people in the uh, different countries uh, on a global basis, they will capture insights and uh, share on a platform and uh, that platform uh, has a back end a with an ability to fundamentally cluster the key insights by keyword or by key issue. Also, another one very interesting is a people world. Uh, those are only two examples. I think they developed six or seven different tools. Uh, people world is a different example. It's a, it's a little bit like a Google Insight. Uh, so it's a Unilever. So they do thousands and thousands of uh, market research and research documents and uh, market studies uh, from uh, Brazil to Europe to Vietnam on a global basis. So those documents are spread globally uh, on different marketing departments, different people. So they created a unified database and they created an algorithm and, uh, with a very simple AI behind. So you can actually search and uh, search any of those documents and, uh, and that's uh, incredible uh, powerful for any brand manager or for any marketing manager. So the headline they use for people world is, is uh, the one you can see here. If only Unilever knew what Unilever knows. And this has been extremely, extremely successful and, uh, and uh, just relying on existing information. So I call this the in, in Google, the internal Google. So if we go to the Next item on the agenda, which is how to apply. Uh, I'll go back to the characteristics of uh, best practices. So the best practice is what they do. The first, they uh, spend some thinking about who could be these sensors. Are just the sales reps or in B2B, for example, it can be the engineering uh, force on the field, so the technical support. 
people on the field. It can be also the marketing people or it can be anybody like Intuit. So, but no, a decision uh, needs to be made. Who are the target groups who are going to be responsible for the generation of a customer insights? After uh, step two is uh, in identify the, the methods. Is this only qualitative? Uh, so it's about uh, customer exploration. It's about design thinking. It's about uh, probing. Or is also quantitative, like in the case of Unilever, where they developed it, where they were integrated the quantitative uh, and the qualitative part of a generation of a customer insights. After the design of a methods and, and tools, then you need to train the sensors. So that sensors, they can be successful only if they know how to do effectively their activity of a customer inside generation. So we need to train extensively, a little bit like Toyota, is, is an obsessive training on very simple tools and on very few tools. Number three, uh, many companies, they don't have that process, the inside generation process. That process needs to be not only designed, but integrated together with the marketing and innovation. And there is a lot of change management here because uh, marketing and innovation to be on board, sales people need to be on board. So uh, three different functions at least, that they are a little bit silo oriented in some companies, they need to be integrated into a seamless process because the process is cutting through a number of different functions. And uh, number four, uh, unless you put in the job description a time, for example, uh, as a technical uh, support service, you need to spend uh, one hour, two hours per month on uh, uh, using, um, using them for observation. Unless that is in the job description and is uh, documented and is rewarded, this is not going to happen. You will uh, find a lot of uh, resistance and conflict with the goals of uh, the individual sales reps and the individual uh, technical support people and uh, whoever are the sensors. So if, uh, in, uh, if I go to the e benefits, so those are the benefits we have seen in some of the companies where we've been uh, supporting them into this uh, transformation to be more inside driven. The first one is, uh, is uh, I go back to Peter Trager. Uh, so the ability to generate systematically customer insight. So to be systematic in the generation of a customer insight is only something that is going to happen if you have a process, if you have a system, if you have a model uh, similar to the one I described. Otherwise, it will be spot, otherwise it will be project-based, otherwise it will be market research study-based. But no, how to be systematic and continuous, this is, uh, this is a big benefit of a process and, uh, like this. The second one, with uh, uh, an incredible volume of insights, and the ability to generate um, MVP tests, MVP tests uh, in very short cycling uh, cycles on a global basis uh, for multinational. So the success rate of a new product can, can increase dramatically. Uh, the third benefit is uh, actually the companies who have implemented this system have a nearly zero based market research budget. So because you actually, you are internalizing, not only you are internalizing, you are creating a a much larger volume of hours of a market research and internalizing using people who are already in the payroll. So you can actually re reduce significantly the external market research budget. And the last two are um, uh, straightforward, but no, let me spend a word on uh, the last one. So the, uh, one of the most effective ways to create a culture of a customer centricity is uh, to have the people in front of the customers. Uh, make them to speak with them. Even if you are a finance manager, if, even if you are a research scientist, just uh, speak to the customer and you will uh, understand the pain, you will understand the needs, you will understand the context of the customer and they will develop a different sensi sensitivity and, uh, and this is a key lever to change the culture on a broad basis uh, to become more customer centric. So the question is how you get started because you know, this is a transformation of a company. Uh, how do you get started? And the system I presented for Arena and for Unilever is a system at a full implementation, but no, how do you get there? 
at full implementation. And here there are a couple of practical tips and, uh, and consideration. The first one is uh, start with existing projects. Uh, so don't, don't, don't try to figure out a new fancy stuff. I'm pretty sure any company has uh, projects in uh, the marketing and innovation pipeline. Those projects uh, ideally early stage, they need a lot of uh, validation. They need a lot of uh, lean experimentation with customers. So pick one or two, few of those projects, and those uh, are the use cases, the initial use cases. Then on those use cases, identify a small group of sensors. If you have a, a sales force of uh, thousands of people, you don't want to start uh, you know, training uh, thousands of people. Just identify maybe in a region, maybe in a country, uh, only anything between 50 to 100 people, so a, a manageable number of people, and you train them. Uh, and then when you have trained them on uh, uh, very simple tools and very simple techniques, uh, this uh, small group of sensors uh, can go and test the hypothesis on the use cases uh, that you have identified on number one, which are already existing. So you are immediately creating value because you are applying insight generation at zero cost on existing projects, and maybe there is an MVP to be tested on a global basis, and the MVP can be tested very quickly in a few weeks using the sensors that you, you tested on an existing project. Number four, instead of doing like um, Unilever, who develop a, Unilever developed an in-house app, which is obviously cost, and it's going to take time, at least for the pilots. Now, there are existing uh, market research application who have a collaborative functionality, but also they have a back end which is able to cluster uh, by key issues and by key insights, so all the information coming from the field. I think, no, the recommendation here is to start with something which is available on the market and uh, is, is, is a minimum cost. You can actually rent for the pilot. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a way to get started immediately because you don't need to wait months for information technology to develop a, a, a customized app for the company. Then uh, you want to simulate, number five, you want to simulate a process, even if you don't have a process, because then the process needs to be designed and formalized, but no, you want to simulate the process. So in those use cases, you want to have a marketing and innovation or both of them involved, and they will be part of the conversation. They will be, so when an insight is generated in the field, or when an MVP is coming back with a feedback from the field, so they are part of the conversation on the, on the app. They provide feedback, they provide additional questions, they provide additional hypotheses to be uh, investigated for the sensors, and so that process is simulated on an actual uh, use case or a number of use cases before even uh, designing uh, the, you know, the full process. Uh, try to make a uh, number six of those pilots a success because uh, based on the success, we can then uh, learn, capture the learning, and, and plan for the scaling up. In closing, and before opening to questions, uh, I want to do an experiment with you. No, assuming uh, that we are a large company on a global basis. So I go, no, let's assume we are a B2B company of 30,000 employees, obviously a multinational. And this multinational company has uh, 2,000 sales reps or key account managers and uh, 1,000 uh, customer support engineers. Usually the support engineers, the technical support engineers are on the field, so they interact with customers. So there is a total of 3,000 people. Those 3,000 people are identified like our sensors. So those are our sensors. Then we routinize uh, the time they spend in, uh, in front of a customer, doing customer observation, or doing customer explorations, or using the tools that we provided them, and we train them. Let's assume it's uh, three hours. You know, if you are a sales rep, in a month, you spend three hours, it's reasonable. It's not that we are asking to spend two or three days, and those two, three days are taken out from uh, the goal of selling and whatever is the, the sales goal for the month for that sales rep. Yeah? So it's spending three hours. So if you do a very simple uh, exercise, uh, what would be the total hours of a market research per year of this company? And, uh, and it's very simple. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a big number. So it's in, this, uh, in this experiment, in this scenario, 
we are talking about more than 100,000 hours of insights from customers' explorations and market research per year for a company on a multinational uh, and global basis. And there is no market research, even at Procter & Gable, even at some of those consumer goods giants, there is no market research that can generate such a number of hours of a field in front of a customers, non-customers, or um, uh, traders, because you, know, you can actually a apply also the tool for doing explorations with the trade. And uh, this is uh, what we call, well, this is what I call uh, the big qualitative data. And if we integrate a bigger qualitative data with big data on a quantitative basis, this is unbeatable in our experience in terms of a generation of insights and all the benefits that we have seen before in creating a truly insight-driven organization. Thanks to all. I finish here my presentation, and I think, Veronica, maybe we want to open it to Q&A. Yes, thank you so much, Alessandro. Uh, we would now like to open the floor for questions. If you would like to submit a question, you can enter it via the webcast platform, and your question will be read time permitting. Uh, just as a quick reminder, Alessandro will decline to answer questions on certain topics related to confidential matters. So we'll dive right into the first question. Um, Alessandro, I'm getting a couple of these. Can you talk about um, major implementation barriers and how we can bypass some of those in this process? Yeah, there are a number of them, like all those uh, you know, transformation and uh, significant change initiatives. I think the most important is, uh, uh, is that there is a lack of a clarity or uh, sometimes it's completely undefined who is accountable for this. Because if you look at a Unilever case, so they created actually, before starting the transformation, they created a U a new corporate unit of insight generation reporting to the CEO. And only when that was set, that unit was accountable and responsible for setting and designing and, and then executing a system like the one I described. Uh, and this is a, a case of a clear accountability and a clear responsibility who is driving this uh, in terms of uh, being the architect. In many companies, you don't have this situation, so who is accountable for doing it? Who is accountable for designing and then executing? Is it sales? Is it marketing? Is uh, market research? Is uh, strategic planning? So it's, it's, a, it's quite unclear, so this is one of the major uh, implementation barrier. And when you have an, a, a barrier like this, I, I think uh, this should be a topic discussed in the, you know, if you are in the business unit, should be the executive of the business unit. If you are at corporate level, should be the executive at corporate level because there is nobody who is accountable for all the different pieces. So the commercial person is responsible for the sales force and then the marketing is responsible for the marketing, the innovation is responsible for the innovation, but nobody is responsible for the different pieces. So you have seen in the uh, inside generation process, you have a three or four different departments involved and you need to have all of them working seamless on something like this. So I think this is, a, uh, one of them, probably the most relevant I encountered, uh, there, there are a few ones, but I think, uh, let me stop here and just mention this one, which is the most frequent, the most, um, unfortunately, the most popular. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so moving here, uh, I have a question that says, by using internal sensors to generate insights and move to reduction of external market bu research budget, do you worry about bias in results? For example, will the insights favor company capabilities versus what is truly needed? Uh, actually, uh, no. Uh, we, we, we found that no, there was uh, no significant uh, bias, at least in the uh, cases we studied as uh, best practices, also some of the consulting projects that we've been carrying on. Uh, because uh, you, you can think about uh, uh, a system that can be spontaneous or it can be prompted. Yeah? So it's spontaneous is when you have a system like this, on a spontaneous way, you, know, you have uh, the sales rep or the technical support people who are observing something or doing a number of probing questions capturing an insight and sharing, and this is the spontaneous. And maybe you can have a little bit of a bias there uh, because they are looking for something which is, you know, they, you know, it would be based on their bias or the mental bias. 
a mental hypothesis. But no, the second part is uh, not prompted. In that case, it's really up to the marketing and innovation people. Um, I have uh, an hypothesis, I have an assumption to be tested, or I have a concept to be tested. And uh, this is not different from market research. So if I design correctly the questions and the assumptions that I want to test, and I provide uh, a very well designed MVP, for example, supporting those assumptions that the salespeople they can show and the salespeople they know how to present that concept MVP and be silent initially so because they've been trained so they are not creating bias in the way they are handling uh, the conversation. I, and that's what happened in, uh, in our experience. You know, we didn't see any bias actually. Okay, thank you for that. How do you train individuals to observe and generate insights, especially if they've never been asked to do this before? Do you have any suggestions on insight observation trainings um, for sensors? Well, this is uh, uh, the reason why many companies are stuck in the only for professionals uh, quadrant that you have seen uh, on no, slide two or, or three of my presentation is uh, that no, everybody in the company believes that this is a rocket science, it's difficult. And actually, this is, a, this is not our experience. So if we take uh, very simple techniques like uh, observations or uh, explorative, explorative interviews using, for example, the phi y or the laddering techniques. So those are techniques that uh, you, know, you can actually develop some simple training material and uh, you can deliver multiple time uh, multiple times and uh, to the sensors, who are the identified sensors. So then this is step one. No, it can be in class, or it can be on online training. But no, I think the step two is, uh, is, is, is extremely important. That's not enough. The first observation, the first exploratory interview of uh, the sales rep or the technical support people needs to happen with uh, someone shadowing him. So uh, this is extremely important because unless the first one, the first two is done uh, with someone who is going with uh, the sensor and helping him to understand from the mistakes, from the missteps, and then uh, doing better the second one, and then the third one, he can actually be very independent. So it's not only training in class, but no, some shadowing, for the first couple of interviews. And then is, uh, no, in our experience, even as someone who has been just selling or just an engineering or providing technical support, it can be very, very effective in generating customer insights. Okay, thank you so much, Alessandro. Do the customers you select make a difference in the quality of your, of your results? So how do you avoid talking to just your best customers over and over again? Well, that's, uh, no, is, um, so this is a potentially an issue, right? Because no, is, uh, if you are uh, um, talking to your customers and, uh, and then from the center, someone, for example, global marketing or someone from global innovation is asking, uh, uh, please, you in Australia and you in Brazil, I need you to interview some of the customers to check those two points or those two assumptions. So what will happen uh, naturally is the sales rep will go to their friendly customers. Yeah? And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is not bad, but no, uh, when this happens, then the central marketing or the central innovation, they need to push back a little bit and ask for extra data point, so extra observations or extra interviews also with uh, some of the unfriendly customers or the non-customers. And uh, this is a counterintuitive. Actually, we found that uh, when you go to a non-customer or an unfriendly customer and you try to engage them not on selling something as usual, because, uh, but no, trying to say, I want to have a conversation to better understand your context and your needs around this product category, that conversation can sometimes happen in an easier way than just having a conversation on trying to sell something or on the complaint they received on a specific product. 
So it can be also what we found is that while initially the sales force or some of the people in the sales force, they push back a bit on something like this, they run through a number of those interviews in first person and they understand it is also a way to engage uh, cold customers or unfriendly customers or sometimes to expand also good existing customers because no, they take the conversation to a different level which is more strategic. They generate insights on their context, something that usually they don't do because they do product selling. So they love it. At the end of the day, they end up to love it. Yeah? Uh, so it's uh, not only is uh, no, pushing back, trying them to do interviews also the unfriendly customer because it's good for the inside generation, but it's also good for the sales rep at the end. Okay, thank you. The companies in the examples that you gave are B2C companies. So how do you apply this thinking to B2B and B2B to C world? Well, we don't see differences between applying a system like this between B2C and B2B. So it's a applicable also in B2B. Uh, I have another example. Uh, you no, know, we did a consulting project for uh, one of the global leaders in uh, optical fibers, and uh, particularly in the business unit working on uh, data centers. So there is uh, something called structure cabling in optical fiber for the data center. And obviously this is a B2B work, and the client is uh, no, the big uh, data center operators yeah, from um, Amazon uh, to Microsoft uh, to Apple and uh, the telco operators. So those are the customers. And uh, we apply in their work uh, and they were using uh, historically something, no, they were calling, many companies called the voice of a customer. And the voice of a customer in B2B tech oriented type of businesses is always very, very performance based. So I have a new product. I want to understand that new product in terms of functionalities and performance, which is usually technology based, how is uh, benchmarking compared to the previous one or compared to some of the competitors and compared to the needs. So this is what they call the voice of a customer of this client but in my experience it's applicable to all the technology B2B world. And then we went with this different approach and it was, again, it was very insightful because no, it was shifting the conversation from technology product performance to a more context, understanding the context and understanding based on the context which are the strategic priorities and based on the strategic priorities of those customers, how could eventually the needs in the short term and the immediate term could change. So we applied very successful. Uh, this is one example in B2B. And uh, actually it's even more efficient if you wish in B2B because of the number of sales reps and technical support people is uh, no sometimes or uh, uh, smaller than a consumer goods. So you can actually apply the system training and involving a smaller number of people. But no, we, we don't see in any case, we don't see it big differences of effectiveness between B2C and B2B. Okay, thank you. Um, can you talk about how you capture, analyze, and prioritize the insights from the big qualita qualitative data since that's so much data coming in every single month? Yeah, yeah no, this is an excellent question. So when you do the pilot, you really don't care. But no, when you scale to thousands and thousands of hours of a market research, particularly the spontaneous one, uh, because you, know, you can have a prompted system. It's like you are doing a market research, you have a prompted, you have an assumption, you test. This is more manageable, but when it's spontaneous and you're multinational, uh, so you have a, what, no, I define a big qualitative data uh, coming back. So uh, that's impossible to do on a manual basis, even if you have a few people uh, fully dedicated uh, central level. So you need to automate it. And that's where uh, something like a Unilever, uh, that's why Unilever at the end uh, developed an in-house app. Because no, this uh, is not just the interface, it's not the user experience of the app, it's uh, the back end. The back end is an algorithm, which is actually clustering by keywords all the insights. 
and uh, sorting them. And, and so you need a technology at that point. You need a piece of technology to do it on a proper basis. So if you're a multinational, if you have a large number of uh, employees and sensors, and if the number of hours of a market research starts to be in the 10,000 plus, probably you need to go into something like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alessandra, we're getting a lot of questions about training tools, material, materials you recommend. Um, you talked about the five whys. Is there anything else that you can recommend to folks on the line? Um, no, I, I, I think, uh, no, the three tools that you can actually train in a very simple uh, way, your, your sensors are, at least in my experience, obviously observation in context, uh, so there are a number of uh, you know, uh, books and uh, papers and on how to do it. Uh, the second one is uh, explorative interviews. Uh, so the exploration is um, a qualitative interview on, uh, and you can use uh, techniques that can be the five Y or the laddering or similar ones, but no, fundamentally is uh, trying to go in depth. Do few interviews, but not go in depth. And the, um, uh, the last one is uh, when you have an MVP, the MVP can be a storyboard, it can be even uh, two pages of a PowerPoint where you have something to show. Uh, uh, that is a different technique because no, you need to show something and at the same time, you want to capture the feedback, initially being silent because you don't want to create bias, and then you start to do the probing. And the probing is very similar to the customer exploration techniques, so the five Y and the laddering. But no, when, when, it, when you present the MVP, so you, the, the, no, the initial part of presenting it and how you present it and how you show that can create a lot of bias. So that part, for me, is a, is a tool number three and needs to be done very well. So those are very three simple tools. There are a number of them, but I think those three are a good start. And uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, material available. Uh, you can go on, on Google, you can buy books, but no, there is a lot of material available on those three techniques. Okay, and along the same lines, are there any suggestions on platforms or systems that can be used to build the data collection and insight development infrastructure? Is there any app available, um, or are these all proprietary to each company? No, something that Arena, the company I mentioned, used uh, is, uh, this, uh, is a Canadian app. Uh, I think it's very cheap, value for money. They do have a little bit of a back end. Uh, functionality which is able to cluster, obviously no, is not able to uh, sustain a significant number of hours, but no, it's, a, it's a very good for the pilots and for the initial phase, it's called iTrax, so that's something you can look into it. Uh, but initially for the pilots, any collaboration tool uh, will be, probably will be working, any app where you can actually create a group uh, in, the, in the group, there, is, uh, there are all the sensors and all the people with corporate innovation or corporate marketing, uh, and they share and they post, and, uh, and uh, so that would be probably also good enough for a pilot, but no, those are all solutions that are good for the early stage startup. Uh, when you go on big volumes, then you need to figure out something like uh, Unilever. But no, to get started, uh, no, you can give a look at iTrack, which is... Uh, um, no, you can download it from Apple Store. Okay. Thank you so much, Alessandro. I know we're running um, very close to time here, so I think this might be the last question we can get to. Can you talk about how uh, to get closer to customers if your daily activity is very far away from them, and what incentives do you see for management to allow people to explore um, these options? Well, it's, uh, this is the case of uh, Intuit. Uh, so Intuit is said, even if you are a finance manager, even if you are the CEO, even if you are uh, uh, far away, a software developer. No, in their case, no, they have a lot of uh, software developer and engineers, software engineers. No, even if you are uh, not dealing with a customer on a daily basis, makes sense for you to spend 
uh, some hours every year in front of the customer. And the reason why they do it is, uh, yes, because they want to develop more insights, but it's not in the case of Intuit, the reason why they go beyond the sales reps and the technical support people is for the culture. And if everybody is spending a few hours in front of the customer, what we say about customer centricity culture is, 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 is much easier because everybody understands a customer, the context, the pain points, what they want, the language, and also they understand the efforts of people who are dealing with customers uh, in, in, in other parts of the company. Uh, so I think that's uh, the rationale, that's the message on how to sell it. If you want to go and identify sensors beyond the natural groups, which are the ones I mentioned, sales reps and technical support people and marketing people, uh, and, and, and I can see from the experience of Intuit, it's probably the more customer-centric company that uh, I've seen in technology and uh, in, in many other industries, and they kept the customer centricity from a startup of a few people to now being uh, thousands and thousands of people. And they've been uh, to keep the obsession for customer centricity also thanks to the fact that everybody has to, so it's a must because it's in the job description, spend some hours in front of the customer, even if you are not dealing with the customer with your job description. Okay. Thank you so much, Alessandro. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. So thank you again for your time and insights, and thank you as well to all of our participants who joined and contributed questions to today's call. If you would wish to follow up with Alessandro directly, you can do so by contacting your GLG representative. Uh, lastly, we will be sending you a brief survey and would greatly value your feedback on today's presentation. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you.